Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, finding the theater room, which was uh, an adventure for me. I know about you. Uh, my name is Eric Smalling. I am a developer advocate at Sneak. We, too, we are a developer uh, tooling company that specializes in security-related scanning kind of things. Not here to talk about Sneak today at all, though. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, hacking a, a Kubernetes cluster and how that can happen to you. A um, little bit about myself. I am a developer background. I am not an operations background. So if you're going to ask when you hear me answer questions, it's, that's the point of view I come from. I've done about 20 to 30 years, depending on how you look at it, in developer, DevOps, whatever. I'm a Docker captain. Um, I, you'll see grayed out my CKA because it just expired, but I do have, I'm about to renew my CKA, but I have uh, the, the normal Kubernetes uh, certifications you uh, might expect. Uh, if you care, I'm Eric Smalling on most of the socials, um, and that's that. Uh, this is going to be a really quick run through this. You won't be able to follow along in this setting, but if you care to try this out afterwards, that is the GitHub repository that everything is in here. I'll put that up again at the end of the slides and you can take a picture of it now or then. Um, it's a full workshop that you can, we do, we, I, I do this sometimes in like in a big four hour kind of a thing where we tutorial walk through it. But today I'm just going to run through it real quick and try to get the gist of it for you. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about how the combination of app vulnerabilities and misconfigurations can allow attacker to spread the radius of their, of, of their attack to uh, basically try to get to where they can take over a cluster. Now this is a pattern that almost every major exploit in recent years um, has followed. Application vulnerability uh, gives an attacker the initial foothold and uh, they can then set up a beachhead and then take application and infrastructure misconfigurations to extend that attack to the other parts of your system. And of course today we're going to be talking about this in the context of Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to walk you through the <laughs> exploiting. It's a contrived exploitation in this case. I don't have time to set up an entire you know, uh, uh, how to exploit and you know, uh, using an, a real RCE, but we've got one that looks like an RCE um, to that point all the way to exploiting cluster. Not going to be much slides, really. This is all going to be um, demo. Hopefully that's uh, what you came to see. But to set the stage, what we're going to start from is that we have uh, what we know as, as if we put our black hat on is we have found a vulnerable web server out there, some port 80 that, it, that is uh, vulnerable to a remote code execution exploit. Now in this case, it's going to be a contrived one that we, I've built a Flask app that allows me to do commands in it. Uh, but this is the, a real kind of thing. Uh, if you remember Log4Shell, Spring4Shell, these are both RCE type exploits that, especially in Log4Shell's point of view, were, were widely exploitable and easily exploitable. Um, and you'll also see, and when we get into the, I'll be showing this, these slides kind of sort of on the GitHub repository. Uh, I have a graph, we're going to be going, what we call a timeline of doom. Whereas the scope increases as we go, we start from this initial exploit. We, we know we have an RCE in a container, and that's enough slides. So let me show you what that looks like. Now, again, this is the GitHub repository. And I just want to take a second to say, if you see anybody from Sneak talking about anything and they give you a repository with the word goof in it, Kubernetes goof in this case, that is highly vulnerable. Don't deploy this anywhere you care about. Because if you put this in production, this one's pretty contrived and not that bad of a deal. But we have other ones out there that have log for shell or Python exploits or other exploits in there. Don't deploy them anywhere. You have been warned. Just your laptop, just some sandbox that you own. So I'm going to be walking through this as you know, as you would if you're going to be using this GitHub repository. There's a whole bunch of steps. We're going to go through the exploit, and then we're going to talk about quickly some mitigation patterns and and technologies you can use to head these things off. The main gist of this is don't just deploy your own Kubernetes cluster and expect it to be secure by default. Don't ignore vulnerabilities in your applications. You pay attention to all this kind of stuff, and um, it will serve you well. So the first thing we're going to do is, i um, skipping the setup here because I've already cached it all locally and, set, and uh, done that, uh, is we're going to uh, take a look at this. We've, like I said, we, we're a hacker. We have found this, this vulnerable app. Now, of course, uh, this is just a last app with a thing on it. But if I, if I do, I found that if I send command equals, and we'll say, uh, who am I? It ran who am I in the context of this server out there. So we can see that my, I'm a user named web admin. 
Um, now, the first thing I might want to do, if I had such an exploit, is let's take a look at our environment. What's going on on this server? Uh, or at least in this, this uh, environment, this, uh, the, the environmental variables. And you can see here, we've got, oh, we've got a bunch of Kubernetes port stuff. We've got uh, other things related. But we can kind of tell from the names of these variables, we're probably running in a container in a Kubernetes cluster, right? The important one that I'm going to note here is this Kubernetes port. That IP and port is an internal IP address, and in Kubernetes world, this is your API server from the point of view of this pod. That's interesting. So if we go back over to our steps, um, the next thing I'm going to do is I want to know, just for my own notes, uh, what's the IP address of the, of the machine I'm on? So we're going to hit that, and we're going to do CMD equals IP. Oh, I thought I had this cache, sorry. IP percent 20 A. I can't type. Let me just copy this. That's what I normally do. Actually, I just click it. There we go. So there's the IP address, the internal IP address of this pod in the pod network. That's good to know. So next, we're going to go back to our steps so I don't get ahead of myself. And we're going to talk about what we found out. So we know we, we have an RCE vulnerability on port 80. We figured out from the variables, we're probably running in a Kubernetes cluster. And we also saw, if you noticed in there, there was a web service port, and it was 5,000. So we're probably behind listening actually on port 5,000, meaning we have some kind of ingress or something that's mapping us to that. So 5,000 is the port we care about as far as internally. And we know what IP address of the pod we're on. So we're, we're at the point where our, my slides were. So now, let's get into this. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to try to get access to the API server for this cluster. So every Kubernetes pod by default has a service, every service account has by default a token associated that will get auto-mounted as a secret into the pod uh, that, you're, uh, that is running. So let's take a look at that. What I've done here is I've run a cat command. I've catted out that token at var run secrets Kubernetes IO service account token. Now, as I said, we'll get to the end, we'll talk about mitigations here, but one of the things we've, we've done here is we've taken, a, taken advantage of a default in service accounts where this auto mounting of the token happens. You can turn that off. So when you create a service account, you don't have to by default have this there. They leave this here because your program may need to, your process may need to talk to the API server. You may be running some kind of utility that actually talks to Kubernetes. Most of your business apps don't. Bad idea, in my opinion, to uh, leave this set to the default, but they did because that is the default, and you know, that's what happens. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to take note of that. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and this is just a note that you could actually find that also out, even if I didn't have an RCE, if I had a directory traversal type exploit, you can get into other files on a file system and you could find out, uh, you can get into the proc file system and see your environment through that. Side note. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to see if I've got access to a couple other things. So I'm going to run curl against google.com. And sure enough, I have curl at my disposal. So curl is in the image that this, uh, this process is running. Uh, for whatever reason. And when I hit google.com, I got a 301 move back. So I got a successful connection to Google. I could have used any internet-based uh, thing there, but that's telling me, ah, network controls aren't very tight here. I've got internet access. So I've curl at my disposal. I have internet access. Now, honestly, at this point, a lot of hackers would be simply going to their S3 bucket or something, pulling down a script and mining crypto or doing whatever they want, you know, want to do on the free cycles you just uh, provided to them. But we're going to go a little farther. We're, we're going after a cluster. We don't care about uh, Bitcoin or anything at this point. So what I'm going to want to do now is I want to take the information I've gathered. I want to use curl to try to attack the API server itself. And because I have very limited time here, I'm just going to issue this and we'll take a look at what I've found. So the, imagine I've gone through and I've started iterating through every, time of, every type of endpoint I can think of on a Kubernetes API cluster, and I've found that endpoints, to use the term twice, is, is open for some reason. What I've done is I've run curl, I've fed the CA cert, 
at this path, var run secrets, which is the default place that it'll, it'll drop it. If the token is there, the CA cert will be right next to it. And I've used that token as the authorization bearer going after the Kubernetes ports that we saw in the environmental variables, API v1, namespaces, default endpoints. So I, I'm hitting the endpoints in the default namespace. And if I look through this data, now I'm running locally cached here so that I have to worry about you know, Wi-Fi. Um, I'm running a kind cluster, which if you're familiar with Kubernetes and Docker, it runs inside of kind of a nested Docker networking situation. So my cluster is local host to me. But in a normal situation, that IP address would be the externally facing API um, IP address, or there would be one of them in there that is that IP address. Now, you might say, well, Kubernetes clusters shouldn't be exposed, the API server shouldn't be exposed to the internet, right? Well, this is just from last May. They are. People expose their clusters all the time. It happens. Um, also, this could just be, you know, I could be attacking this from malware installed on a developer's laptop on the VPN of your company, and this is a QA cluster. Uh, it's still valuable to me. So um, doesn't matter. I've now figured out, uh, let me scroll down. Uh, new info we found out now is that I have um, a service account and pod configuration to get me that, that token because they left the default set for this auto, auto mount service account token. I have found that and I've been able to get at a, uh, the API server with it and found that uh, the endpoint is available on that, on that cluster. So our timeline of doing, we've added a couple things. We have a pod token available to us and it allows access to the endpoints API. So the next step I'm going to do is I want to find out a little bit more info about, information about this cluster. But this is getting annoying dealing with the remote code execution command, you know, having to do it through a browser or a curl or everything. I'd like to get direct access using kubectl into this cluster. So if I take what I learned, which is this token, I'm going to copy it. And if you are doing this uh, demo, there is a little helper script here that's, I'm going to create a kube config that has that token in it. And like I said, this is kind, so I'm really on localhost 6443, but I put in my endpoint here if it wasn't. So I'm gonna run that. And I'm going to kubeconfig equals, it drops this into a local file called demo kubeconfig. So now if I do, I have kubectl alias decay, uh, get pods. Oh, forbidden, pods is forbidden. Well, that's interesting, but it's telling me a little bit more information here. Um, you can see in this error, the user, blah, 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 cannot list resource pods in the, in the default namespace, but in the user, there's a namespace in there. System service account secure. There is a namespace named secure. And this is an example of namespaces not really being security boundaries because just because you name your namespace secure doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. So let's try the same command in that namespace, since that's where this token came from. And sure enough, I can see a pod running in that namespace. I am now connecting from an external uh, terminal using kubectl into this cluster's secure named namespace, and I can see one pod running. And just to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself, go back to my notes. We talk about that in here. And um, Let's find out a little bit more here. Let's see what else this thing can do. So I can do k auth can I, oops, can I dash dash list. In the default namespace, ooh, that is two, there we go. In the default namespace, is that still legible? You guys okay? Um, you can see in, for whatever reason, RBAC is set to allow endpoints in here because maybe they need to control Kubernetes from their app for some reason, I don't know. But I had, access to endpoints and default, but nothing else really. All this other stuff is just boilerplate. If I ask now in the secure namespace, what can this token do? Resources wildcard has all the verbs. This is not that uncommon. A developer may make a service account um, and, and are back for their application in their deployment and think, hey, it's my namespace. I need to be able to do whatever. I don't know what all I need to do. I'm just gonna blanket give myself everything in this namespace. And I appreciate that as, as, as a bad actor. Because now I'm going to do some other things here. So let's uh, make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. So that's me being happy that I have now found this. 
Um, so my new info is that the token gathered has, has limited access in default, but it has wide access, broad access in the secure namespace. A little visualization of the things we know about the cluster now. And I apologize, I'm going really fast because this is a lot I'm trying to get through. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Uh, timeline of Doom, we've added the fact that the service account gets too many permissions in this namespace. So now let's attack this pod. Let's go after it and see what, what we can find out or what we can do from it. So if we look at that pod, and we, we're going to go ahead and uh, try to exec into it. So if I do a k get pod on secure namespace, I want to do k exec with a terminal into the, in the secure namespace, into web admin, blah, blah, blah. And let's just see if we can start a shell. Of course I can. So here I am, and we know from the exploit before that we're the web admin user. That's a good thing. At least whoever designed this image and, or deployment is not running as root in the container. Um, so I don't have elevated privileges in this container. Uh, let's see if I can mutate the file system. Let's just to touch a file. I can. So I was able to create a foo file. You can see at the bottom there, owned by the web admin user in this uh, user source app directory. So this is uh, not a read-only root file system uh, container. If you're familiar with the way container runtimes work, when you start up your container, the image itself, those layers, it puts those together, those are immutable, basically. Uh, by default, though, it'll put a read-write layer at the, at the logical top that the process sees, if you look at it like a filter. And any mutations happening in the file system are done with a copy-on-write type of uh, action. Uh, that foo was just added to that read-write layer. You can simply start your container in a read-only mode, and it won't create that layer, and it becomes immutable, basically, there's a few asterisks to that, uh, which makes it a little harder for me to mess with your, your contents. Um, but that's just interesting information for me at the moment. What I really want to do is some things that I really do need to be root to do, so I'm going to try to sudo. Now, sudo's not available to me, that's good. They didn't include sudo in their image. That's bad if they had done that. And good for them that they didn't. Um, so you know what? That's that's not as valuable to me because what I want, what I want, what I really want to do is I want to be root in a container. Do so. I'm going to get out of this exec, and I'm going to try to deploy my own container. Um, so first, I just want to see if I can deploy something that is root. So I've got a YAML here called root pod. Simply going to deploy an Alpine image um, and sleep because Alpine defaults to root. So let's just do k apply, demo URLs, I think I believe that's root pod. Oh, <laughs> in the secure namespace, and we'll get pod. I know I could set my default context, but I'm not going to secure. And we got a create container config error. So it, Tried to create it, but let's do a describe on that and see why. Pod. And we see we can see a bunch of information. This is the describe on the pod. It's telling all the details, the metadata about the pod. But the in, in the log we see an error. Container has run as non root, and role, image will run as root. That tells me something is active here that's stopping me. That's turning on the run as non root restrictor. That's in this version of Kubernetes, which is 124, is probably a pod security policy. And I know pod security policies is deprecated and removed. We'll talk about that in a minute. But sure enough, that's what it is. So we've got a PSP that is mutating my deployment to turn on uh, run as non-root. That's a good, pro pro uh, good uh, thing to do, and they are doing it. So I, I can't become root with my own um, pod. So go back to my notes. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to try to start up a privileged pod that's not root. So I have this non-root privileged pod that's going to run an image of my own making that um, runs as a non-root user, but I want to be privileged. Privileged is effectively your container runtime's um, um, insecure mode. It allows you to mount volumes from the host system. It allows you to be, basically do things on the host that you shouldn't be allowed to do. If you're running a business app, you don't need privilege mode. Um, if you're running utilities, if you're running service meshes, and maybe you need the made privilege, but nine times out of 10, you don't. So um, you should not set privilege to true, but 
let's see if I, I can, uh, if they, this cluster allows that. So we're going to do apply. And we're going to do demo URLs, non root priv. And immediately it fails. And it tells me again that, um, oops, <laughs> sorry. When I get going fast, I, I, I forget to type things. Uh, it tells me immediately um, privileged containers are not allowed and that this is pod security policy. So definitely they've spent some time at least crafting a fairly good pod security policy for this, uh, this uh, namespace. So what we know now is um, we're somewhat hardened. The image itself doesn't allow root and doesn't have sudo in it, so I can't elevate. Uh, the, uh, we know that we have a mutable container. That's interesting. Um, we have PSPs in place that are blocking root users and privileged containers. Um, but the one thing, oops, I'm skipping ahead. One thing I didn't try is I've got another one here called non-root, non-priv, which is exactly the same without the privileged mode. So let's try to deploy that. So I'm going to do k apply, demo, your, demo YAMLs, non-root, non-priv. <laughs> secure namespace. And it says it's deployed. And there's a sneaky pod. That is the one I just deployed. And it did deploy OK. So let's exec into that. Now, this is the image of my crafting, so I can do whatever I want. Now, you can see I'm not root. I am the root, the user sneaky. But I made this image. I do have sudo. I can become roots. And why could I do that? That's because just, be, just because you are limiting root and or privileged, escalate privilege is not a default. It is set to true. And this is because some processes historically need to, as they come up often, elevate privilege to do something, or then set up a network thing, do whatever they need to do, and then they drop back down to their normal user. So when the folks at Docker and, and other, you know, the, the container folks set up these defaults, they said, well, we don't want to break, we want backwards compatibility, we don't want to break everything for everybody, so we're going to leave that one allowed. Well, that, that's handy for me because a SUID uh, file like sudo um, is allowed. So um, stop there for a second, that, that's what we know. Um, so the PSP did not al disallow privilege escalation. So that's something you should be setting. If, unless you have applications that absolutely need privilege escalation, in which case I would really tell you to you know, take a look at those apps and see if there's a way to factor that away or to use Linux capabilities to do the same kinds of things. But that's, you know, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, allow privilege escalation should be false in your pod deployments and in your uh, enforcement. So next, I want to get out of this namespace, though. I'm, I've been kind of trapped in this secure namespace. I want to see if we can get out of that now. So what I would like to do is oftentimes on servers, especially if, let's imagine that we are hacking into a QA server or an internal staging server or something, oftentimes there are other copies of the app running that the de developers may be playing with. I'd like to see if I can find another copy of this app out there. Um, in another namespace that maybe isn't as, as well protected. So in order to do that, I'm going to use a, a tool called Nmap. Um, before I do that, I want to see, there's the IP address of this server. I kind of want to get all my ducks in a row so I know what's around me. Uh, we know the IP address of the vulnerable app because we pulled that through the, uh, the browser earlier. Um, now I'm going to use this Nmap tool, which I'm a developer. I don't know. I'm not a network engineer. I'm not a Linux admin. So I know Nmap as a thing that surf that, that you know, go looks for exploits in, in on in programs. I'm sure it has valid uses by network engineers and and for troubleshooting and whatnot. I, I'm not one of those. So what this is saying, I'm going to start this up, and while it's running, I'll talk about it. This is saying search for anybody listening on port any process listening on port 5000 in the subnet. 10.244.162. Uh, it's a slash 24. So any, it's going to look across all the IP space in this pod network looking for anybody else, any other process that's listening on port 5000. Uh, we see two IP addresses came back 162.132 and 162.133. If we go back to my browser, we find the tab that had the IP. 132 is the initially exploitable app that we found first. So that's this one. 
133 is not. That's something else. It's not me. I'm, I'm running 137. So something else in this cluster is listening on 5,000 at that port, <clears throat> at that IP, sorry. Let's, I want to I want to find out what that is. So now I'm going to use another handy tool called SoCat. Oh well, now what I know. And again, if you're doing this later, you can go through this. Um, one thing I know right now is that this network really is not being protected. The fact that I'm able to end map around, look for port, open ports on things, the fact that I get out to the internet, all of that is telling me that they probably don't have a network policy in place. Um, we'll talk about network policies and the mitigations, but uh, if they do have one, it's very wide open. So now I want to try to escape our namespace, and I'm going to use SoCat, which is another nice little tool that allows you to tunnel. And what I'm telling it is, hey, I want you to, is that the right AP? Uh, right. So now I want you to listen on this sneaky pod that I've started up. I want to uh, set up a listener on port 5001. Any traffic that comes into this, send it to this other IP, this 133 port 5000. So that's going to sit there and run. And on another shell, get into the right directory. I'm going to set my kube config. So that's file that uh, I created earlier. Big equals demo kube. And now I'm going to start up a port forward from here. So I'm going to copy and paste this because you can tell how well I'm, I'm, my typing is. Um, so this is saying port forward local host on this laptop to the sneaky pod port 5001 in the secure name namespace, which we saw has SOCAT, which is going to send that. Again, it's going to bounce it twice, basically. So now we'll open another tab, and we'll go to local host 5000 and 1, Eric. Sure enough, it's our app. It's our, it's the, uh, somebody's running another copy of this app out there. I didn't have to put a context on it because there's no ingress in between me and it now. So now let's see if it's exploitable, and yes, it is. So the same exploit is, is available in this process running somewhere else in the cluster, uh, which is nice. So let's, I can get my environment. I can do all sorts of stuff just like I could before. So now what do we want to do? Let's get its token. So let's grab that service account token and come out here. I don't need this tunnel anymore. I don't need SOCAT. I'm going to get out of my exec. I'm going to edit my cube config. Simply going to comment that out and paste this token I just copied from this other instance here and try to get pods. I can get pods in the default namespace now. Um, and that sneaky pod is running from a test I did before the, the started. Let me uh, move pod sneaky. Sorry, that's my bad. Okay, please. Uh, ignore that. <laughs> but I can now get pods in the default cluster. If I do a auth can I dash dash list, I can see that I have wildcard access in the default namespace on this cluster now. The service account I just got is from the default namespace. Um, da -da -da -da, did all that, did all that. And um, so now, I'm going to try to deploy my, my sneaky pod here. So apply demo URL, demo YAMLs, and I'm going to do non-priv, non-root. I'm going to try to deploy my privileged one. And it didn't stop me. And there it is, container creating. So this tells me the pod security policy and the RBAC in default is pretty wide open. Also not uncommon. Um, now, there are religious wars that people who are here at this conference have, have tweeted about recently about whether or not you should allow people to deploy to your default namespace. It is just another namespace. There's no difference between it and Eric's namespace. However, um, and I, I don't care. I, I, have, I, I can argue both sides of that argument. 
However, if you are going to let people deploy to the default namespace, make sure you lock the crap of it down. Man, it is it is so easy to accidentally deploy something there and forget that oh, we never even we didn't lock it down. Um, and in this case, I'm just able to start a privileged container in the default namespace. Um, let me go ahead and exec into it, and we'll see what we can do with it. So here I am in the sneaky pod. And yeah, so we're, we're in here. And I know I can become root in my sneaky pod. So there I am running as root. Now you probably, you might have noticed when I showed the YAML for this, this is also mounting the root file system. And it's putting it into a mount path named ch root. As root right now, if I do a PSAX, I'm seeing the normal things you would see. Now I have a GoTTY running for other demos I give, but let's ignore that. Uh, this is just the processes in this container, in this, in this uh, process namespace. However, if I do chroot, which changes my root Linux volume to that chroot mount, that's the processes on the entire machine. So I basically own this machine now. I am root on this node. Let that sink in a little bit. So what we now know, we have the IP address of another copy of a vulnerable app. We have found that the service account token from that app is in the default namespace. And that, that also means, again, auto service account token is such true, but that's you know, default. Um, our back is wide open in default, and the PSPs are either non-existent or very lax in default because it's default. It's, it's default. It's the default default. Um, so, again, no network controls seem to be in place to allow me to find this, and PSP has uh, little to no restrictions in this namespace. So let's, let's move, the, move forward to get to where we can own this cluster. Um, so, while I'm here, I would like to start poking around um, uh, more on the, on the API server. And I know that my token is only going to be good in the default namespace, but there's another token that's on every node, if you can get at the nodes file system, that, let's see, kube config equals Etsy Kubernetes kubelet. The kubelet has its own config. kubectl, which it's my image. I have kubectl available. I'm going to say get nodes. I can see my nodes now, so I know the names of the nodes. I can say git pod each system. Can I see that? I can. I'm not going to go through a ton of minu uh, minutia here, but given this, now this is getting very interesting. Now, the kubelet, I could try to start a pod with it, but I'll tell you right now, you can't. You can't say uh, kubectl create a deployment, run a pod, because it, it's AP, the API server says, oh, kubelets don't need to do that, because kubelets own the runtime. They, they start their own containers. However, I, I, I could, um, well, I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> um, but what I want to do now is I want to get at the secrets for some elevated privilege controllers and things. So one of the things that, you know, where are secrets kept? They're kept in etcd, right? So let's, uh, um, let's go after that. So the first thing I'm going to do, and this is just talking about that I could try to run BusyBox right here and it's going to fail because the kubelet's not allowed to. Um, I could try to get secrets, and it's not going to let me because the kubelet's not allowed to do that. But there is, if you remember from the pods I just listed, there's an etcd server in there. And I'm going to describe the pod that's running etcd. And this is a common pattern if you just use a kubeadm install of a cluster, and you don't externally deploy etcd, etcd is going to be in a pod right on your control plane. And the information throughout here is going to give me a lot of good stuff about where are the credentials for the etcd server, what IPs and ports are it running on, and all sorts of juicy pieces of information, including where on the host file system are said things installed on that server. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this sneaky pod. And I have another YAML file. What's my time? Total four. Okay. Uh, another YAML file that has an etcd client that I've already, conveniently for kind, 
uh, pre-populated with all the information you just saw from that described. So I'm going to mount the file system. I'm going to start it on the kind control plane node, and I'm going to uh, set it up to connect using those values. So if we go back here, we're going to apply YAMLs at CD client. There it is running. And next, I'm going to copy a command out of here. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just try to do an etcd member list just to see if I've got a valid connection. And I do. You can see I got a response back. So I'm, I am able to authenticate. The client can authenticate and connect to this etcd endpoint. So the next thing I want to do is get all the keys out of it and look for secrets. And I only got a couple. So if you were running Kubernetes 1.23 or older, you would see a long list of secrets here, including a bunch of controllers. In 124, they by default have turned on a feature gate that stops secrets from being created for service accounts. Um, but because it's a feature gate, gates can be turned off. So given that I have the access to start things on the control plane, and I have a nice little pod that I can do that with, I'm going to go edit my non-root priv. Instead of running um, just wherever it wants, I want it to run on the kind control plane. Oops, actually, I have that. You can see I was practicing my demo. I've actually done that. So it it's happens to be running out there. So we'll just use the one that's running. All right, got ahead of myself again. So if I git pod, so I've deployed non root priv. Now, if I do an O wide on this, you can see that it actually is running on the kind control plane already. Um, if I was really doing this by the steps, that would have been on the worker node, and I'd kill it and start a new one on the client. But it's there. So we're going to exec back into it. <laughs> there we go. And we're going to become root again. And we're going to do our cheroots. Now, um, I want to, actually, I don't want, well, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, I don't want a cheroot, actually. I take that back. Uh, Vim's available to me in my container. It's not available to me on that cheroot. So I want to, the CD into the mount I have, Etsy, Kubernetes. And we're going to go into manifests. And this is where you can, your controller, your kube controller manager manifest is. So I'm going to go into the kube controller manager. And there's the configurations. And I'm just going to come down here and add, copy this so I don't typo it. I'm going to add feature gates, legacy, service account token, no auto generate equal false. This is that gate I was talking about. So I've got an extra couple of hyphens on there. This is the gate I was talking about that was changed to true in 124. Now I've just saved that and provided I didn't make any kind of typos, that should be triggering the kubelet on the control plane to kill and restart that. And if I come back out, and I'm stalling to give it a second to do all this. And I do my, oops, here we go. This will take a moment, but as what, what it's going to do is it's going to rip through, and now I've got all the secrets now, because I turned that back, turned that back off, basically. And what I care about is the cluster role aggregation controller token. So if I come back in here, and I'm going to copy a long command up to that, and I feed it the cluster, where'd it go? Cluster aggregation, Z88NJ. That's a token. I get the whole thing? Yes. So now let's edit my demo kube config. Come back to the bottom again and Comment that one out. Change this to the token I just grabbed. K auth can I dash dash list. Yes, so this is a different set, but you can see cluster roles are back authentication. I don't have full control of things, but I do have escalate, 
which is an interesting um, verb. If I come back now, I can use that to escalate. <laughs> so I'm going to basically edit my cluster role. And you see all the limitations I have right now, but if I just would like to do everything, if I do that off again, I now have wildcard on wildcard. I'm now God on the cluster. Uh, I can do pretty much anything I want. Again, we were very limited time today, so I'm not gonna play with a lot, but that's basically game over for your cluster. Um, now, we're not gonna, we walked through this, so I'm not gonna go through all the, uh, what we discovered in there. But so what are some of the mitigations and some of the learnings that we can take from this, right? Uh, the main takeaway is if you got vulnerabilities in your app, that was the first point we got in, you should be looking for those, scanning for those, stopping those. Um, now, of course, my company has scanners you can use for this kind of thing, but use some kind of scanner. Do something to find these things. Every build you're doing, look for um, both vulnerabilities at the build time as well as new vulnerabilities that come up. So you always want to be rescanning and making sure or have tools that will do that for you. You also should be watching your IAC files. So, um, for instance, this is our scanner running against the um, Kubernetes YAML for the contrived web app, and it's telling you, hey, you're not setting privilege escalation control to, to false, or to, uh, yeah, to false. Uh, you know, so catch these things before they even get deployed. Next, <laughs> turn off service account token auto mount. That's another thing that would stop me in my tracks on this path, on this uh, uh, exploit. Um, and this will, if you go through this repo, it will walk you through how to do that. It's very simple, you just turn it on and deploy your service accounts that way. Uh, there's also a pod setting, but just do it with your service accounts, get it done. Um, now we're talking about PSPs, and I know PSPs are dead. However, the reason I continue to show this with PSPs is how many clusters do you think out there are already upgraded to 125 or newer? It's gonna take a while. You're still gonna run into pod security policy. Now, um, in the next page, we'll get into the replacements for pod security policy, but there is not a one-to-one. -one. There is some effort involved in getting off PSPs and onto either PSA or Kyverno or OPA. It's worth doing, you need to do it, but it's gonna take a while, so you still need to pay attention to your PSPs. Um, you want to make sure privilege escalation is being enforced by PSP there. Um, lock down your RBAC permissions, especially pay it, if you're a cluster op, pay attention to default. One humorous thing, I was talking to somebody um, uh, about uh, how did they stop people from deploying and stuff, and they're one of the, on the school of don't deploy to default. He says, I just set my set uh, um, quotas to zero in default. Um, so you can deploy all you want, but nothing's gonna run. Eh, that's interesting, it's fun. Um, I like to sit on network policies for a second though. As a developer, when I first started learning about network policy, I was like, oh, that's firewalls, that's my network team. I, I, don't, I don't understand, that's scary, I don't wanna deal with, I don't wanna be responsible. Network policies are not scary, they are simply a, a YAML representation of what your app needs to talk to, between pods, between you and other services, things like that. It's a nice declarative syntax, and I'm a, I'm a fan of setting up a deny all at first, where like this, where you say for all pods in this deployment, no ingress, no egress. Now, technically you need DNS, which I'm not going into here, but uh, in order to do service discovery, but then you just start adding what you need for your app. For instance, this app needed 5,000 ingress on TCP. So you specify, my apps with this selector allow port 5,000 in. Um, We'll talk about more about learning network policy in a second, but just don't be afraid of it if you're a developer. If you're a, a, an architect, make sure your developers understand network policy. Um, there are CNI-specific network policy things you can be doing, but just in general, be doing it. Um, da, 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 and then in this final section, I'm gonna mention, yes, PSP is being removed. Uh, there's a good blog that Tabitha from the SIG Security wrote, so along with a couple others, on why and what was coming, and then the Kubernetes docs obviously have a ton of information about moving from PSPs to pod security admission. There are some things that pod security admission does not do that PSP did, so honestly, what I see most people talk about is going to a full-on admission controller policy engine like Kubernetes, uh, sorry, like Kubernetes, like Kyverno, or Gatekeeper, which is the admission controller with OPA, you can write, write your stuff in Rego. I don't care which one you use. Use one of these things 
Um, use more than one. I don't care. <laughs> uh, I've seen some people use PSA plus one of these uh, because you can divide up what, what's responsible for what. Network policy-wise, uh, kind of the, the, the stand, standard thing most people know about, and if not, go to here, Ahmed Alped's um, uh, policy recipes. It's a great, simple repository with nice animated graphics showing lots of examples of, hey, if you want to allow all traffic to a specific app, here's an, a way to do it. Uh, so, of course, I pick one that doesn't have a graphic. Most of these have like little animated graphics uh, to explain how they work. Um, the Cilium folks have a nice networkpolicy.io website, which has a graphical representation of, you can craft a policy and see what it would look like logically. Um, if you are going to use CNI specific policies, which you very well can, so a lot of CNIs, aside from flannel, have network policy um, capabilities that, that extend and are, go beyond what the basic Kubernetes ones do, like cluster-wide policies and, and all sorts of interesting things. Make sure you, you understand you're, you're kind of locking yourself to that CNI, which may not be a problem, uh, but you just know what you're doing. The network policy uh, uh, SIG is going through, and, and they have a next generation policy that's going to take a lot of the common things we see across CNIs and implement that. I haven't been following that SIG closely, so I would encourage you to go take a look at what they're doing. There's another interesting one. So I get questions on this a lot where, hey, my company has APM collectors or whatever, or, or, or log collectors, and we all have to be able to talk to those ports. Um, how would I do that and make sure everyone's doing the right thing? This is an interesting example somebody gave me, which is um, there is a project called Hierarchical Namespaces in Kubernetes that allows you to basically set up what it, like it sounds, a subtree dedicated to your ingress, but it inherits from some parent tree. So your parent could have, I, I think of it like if you're old Java developer like Maven, you have a parent palm that de de declares some things and then your project inherits from it, same idea. Um, I've never met anyone using this in production though, so I'd be very interested, uh, tweet me, let me know if you are, I'd love to talk to you. Um, it's a really pretty interesting thing um, in my opinion. And then finally, um, join SIG Security. We all hang out uh, every other week. We meet Kubernetes SIG Security, uh, talk about Kubernetes security, or if you're bigger umbrella, uh, the CNCF security tag. Um, I try to attend those when I can, and uh, they talk security, and, and you can learn a lot of stuff from everybody there and be involved in securing the CNCF projects and uh, things like that. I mentioned SIG Network. The OpenSSF also, if you want to get out of the CNCF world, OpenSSF is all about security. It's a Linux found another Linux Foundation uh, group that uh, it's good to know. And with the remaining couple of minutes I have left, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of time for questions, but I do want to really quickly get to the end of my slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I just want to give thanks to a bunch of people here, especially the SIGs. Um, a lot of the stuff you see here, I learned from these people on the six. Um, that uh, this is not special info that Eric figured out. You learn this, we all uh, sit on the shoulders of other people. That is the repository I've been using. Feel free to clone that. Open issues on it if you have questions or, or have better ways to do things or have ideas. Um, with that, I have exactly, I think, one and a half minutes for any quick question. Otherwise, I'll be in the back if you want to ask afterwards. Yes. Statement in question where most of these things are insecure defaults or poorly set up configurations, if I can ad lib there, uh, whose responsibility is to set those things up? I'd say it's across the board. Uh, your cluster operator, if you are going to run your own Kubernetes, you're not going to use a great managed solution like the ones that our, our hosts here at Sivo offer, uh, which a lot of this would not work in like a, a managed cluster because the control plane is, is hardened. You're paying for that. You're paying that managed, that service provider to do that for you. But in my opinion, obviously your cluster ops, whoever set up your cluster needs to be setting up admission controllers and uh, good settings for the default namespace and things like that. Um, developers though, can't, don't get away free. You need to be doing what I said, you need to be scanning your apps, know, understanding that the deployment YAMLs you're doing, that is infrastructure as code. There's a reason we call it IAC and you need to scan that and, and get it vetted and, and test it and, and work on threat modeling around it, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a very, it's a, a very, shift left dev sec ops kind of a, a discussion is that a okay okay i think i am i'm going to get kicked off the stage here so i will be in the back um i'll be at lunch feel free to walk up ask me any questions you got thank you for your time sorry this was so fast